This is the Crit RPG Podcast, your one-stop shop for everything Lit RPG, Progression Fantasy, and Royal Road. Hi, and welcome uh, to the Crit RPG Podcast. Today, I have a twofer. I have Mystic Neptune and Jolly Jupiter. Welcome. Hi. So, this is going to be recorded with video, but you won't see it because of technical issues. Nevertheless, I can see there is a bright pink play castle or dollhouse behind you. It is very cute and very adorable. It's not mine. No. I mean, well, he plays a lot on it with our daughter Phoebe, who's named after Phoebus, the mm. moon of Saturn. So, Ooh, Ooh that's, that's kind of cool. Yeah, before the show started, we spent a little bit of time talking already. Jolly, you mentioned your teacher. Uh, yes, that's what I do on the side, or I guess I write on the side and I work full time as a teacher, mm -hmm. which cool. makes writing a book about alcohol an interesting kind of... Yeah, I had a chat with admin before I went fully through mm -hmm. with it just to make sure I wouldn't get in trouble. That's a very American perspective. In Germany, you would be held as a hero. I think they still hail him as a hero when they find out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, we, we are in Canada, so it, it, oh. it was pretty much a, yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah, absolutely fine. Good thing you checked. Maybe don't advertise it to your students. I noticed there is actually only three types of writers who write lit RPG. There is college students, teachers, and disgruntled game developers. So, und, Mystic. Und welche bist du? I used to be a teacher. Now I'm an IT manager slash consultant. But Mystic, what about you? Are you a game designer? Oh, I actually play the harp and teach playing the harp. Ooh. So when I wrote my first book, I wrote a CD of songs to go with it. And Ooh. I'm a homemaker, a harp writer. <laughs> Harper Lee is a person who wrote like one book and sold millions of copies. So I definitely see there is a correlation between harps and books. Could write a book on it. Yeah, I could write a book on the harp. Like about harps or on the harp? Oh, on the correlation. Ooh. It sounds like a lot of work when I could be writing more of my web serial that has deadlines. <laughs> ah. Do you want to talk about your web serial that has deadlines? Sure. I mean, I'm pretty sure that's why we're here. We both wrote and made rising stars which mm. is awesome okay and cool i'll talk about jolly my darling husband watched me flail through publishing a ya book and after i had settled in like a comatose person on the floor he looks at me and he goes wife can i write a book <laughs> and i said uh yeah, I am here for support, 100%. And so he goes, okay, I've got this great idea. Um, so I started reading Lit RPG kind of way back. And I'd been reading Royal Road for before Royal Road was anything close to what Royal Road is today. Mm -hmm. And I was playing a lot of dwarf-based video games, specifically Deep Rock Galactic and Dwarf Fortress. And... I remember after one very wonderful gaming session with some friends, I, I thought to myself, you know, is there any dwarf lit for me to read? I'd love to go read some dwarf-based literature. There's almost none. Yeah, so I hopped onto Royal Road and there wasn't any. And this was about two years ago. Two, three, two, three, four years ago. Mm -hmm. And I distinctly remember the moment of looking at the fact there was just nothing and thinking, oh, somebody should really write some dwarf lit. And he turns to me, I'm, I'm not even joking. When he asked me, can I write a book? It was September 1st. By September 7th, he had Beers and Beards planned out. He was posting a chapter a day, 2,000 words, writing every single day. And by October 15th, he had hit Rising Stars and had a publishing contract. And he's like, well, this was not what I was anticipating that was going to happen. I wrote the system first. Uh, which is something I'd recommend to any anybody who's get interested in getting into lit RPG mm -hmm. is have your, your system well fleshed out as one of your first <laughs> things. For proper world building, especially in lit RPG, you want your lit RPG portion to mm -hmm. be well fleshed out. And 
I wrote my first chapter. I posted it to Royal Road. I got, I think, 20 followers on the first day. He oh, had wow. no backlog. I had no backlog. No backlog. I wrote the first chapter. I posted it to Royal Road thinking, I wonder if anybody will be interested in this. <laughs> and I had 20 followers the first day. And then I posted the second chapter and I had huh. 20 followers the second day. And then I wrote the third chapter and I posted it the next day and I had 20 more followers. And I thought, oh, well, I guess people do want dwarf literature. Okay, sure. It wasn't just me. I'm very glad to see that. I was expecting to go nowhere. I thought, you know what? If I can get 50 followers, I will be happy. That will be enough mm -hmm. to give me the motivation to continue writing and doing this thing that's fun. Besides dwarfing your own expectations, I want to talk about how important it is if you're writing or actually want to achieve anything to set low goals. People always say, shoot for the moon, but aim for the stars. And that's true. But lowering expectations is not a bad thing. You're completely right there because it meant that as I started getting more kind of readers, every reader made me happy rather than kind mm -hmm. of coming in with high expectations and feeling bad that I wasn't meeting them. Mm -hmm. So I went and posted on Facebook just to the Lit RPG group and the Lit RPG Reddit saying, hey, you know, uh, people apparently are interested in this fic. Maybe you should check it out. Mm -hmm. And then I got my first shout out oh. and... After that first shout out, they were similar in a fix that it transferred over a couple hundred followers. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And I hit rising stars, but I, I hit it with zero backlog, posting, writing the chapter, and then Mystic would edit it, and then I would post it, and then the next day I would write 2,000 words. And this was while I was still working full time, so it was mostly okay. at like 9 o'clock at night, I'd start writing 11... 30 at night, I'd finish, she would edit, I'd post at midnight. And that was, uh, as soon as I hit Rising Stars, I was pretty much told by this point, I'd started joining some author communities, kind of flailing around in terror. And <laughs> the author communities were pretty much of one mind on if you're on Rising Stars, you need to be posting every day to keep yourself on Rising Stars. Yeah. And so I was posting every day, but I had a three-year-old, well, she was two at the time. It's kind of good he asked me, actually, that he said that, can I write a book? And I said, okay, because then I became, for about two weeks, like a single parent. <laughs> <laughs> He's desperately writing away and being like, my daughter, I want to play with you. <sighs> but the internet needs me. I heard that you edit his works our date nights so we finish our chapters and we swap <laughs> that is relationship goals right there that is really cool uh, i think it also helps because editing your own work is so much harder and you can't see this guys but they're like basically touching ears as they're talking it's really adorable if you have like that kind of relationship and that level of trust that goes with it i think that's really cool because it allows you to go through the editing phase really quickly. It's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So I ended off Rising Stars at around, I think, 3,400 followers. I had my Patreon up. It was going very well. Mm -hmm. I ended up with a publishing deal with Athon, which is oh, coming wow. soon. TM. I can't say Final Edit went out. It's going, gone to audiobook narration. Mm -hmm. and Who did you get as a narrator? I'm allowed to say it's Christian Gilliland. He's oh, the guy okay. who did Full Murder Hobo and Hobo. Uh, Nova Roma. Oh, that's really cool. Huh. Well, congratulations. That sounds great. Yeah. So I'm, I'm super looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. And although I've been told by lots of different people working in audio and writing that you generally don't want to necessarily listen to your own audiobooks, until you're done writing. Until you're done writing. Okay. Can you elaborate on that? When you're writing your characters, you have a feeling for what your mm. character sounds like, how they act, how they behave. It's all in your own mind. But when you send your book to the audiobook narrator, you send essentially a, a sheet that says this is how the various characters speak and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But they do their own acting for those characters. And then if you're especially unlucky... 
you get someone like Travis Baldry who like completely transforms your work into a transcendental piece of art. And then like it's completely different now and you just can't do it anymore. I guess right. you. and you're yeah. sitting there trying to write the character thinking, how would Travis Baldry voice and act this scene out and then you fall apart because you just can't yeah. be as good. And and yeah. like it becomes a problem when every single person you're writing sounds like Travis Baldry in your head. Because he's really you say wonderful. that like that's a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. He's wonderful. We may have <laughs> listened to most, if not all, of his audiobooks. <laughs> but I think you see you said you got Christopher, right? Christian Gilliland. I think his work is pretty good too. But okay, so I, I see Mystic, you want to say something. Christian Gilliland sent Jolly a full like ten minute nerd out of how he wanted to what? be the narrator, including songs and different dwarves and all the gnomes and like he, when it came to songs, he would sing the songs. And he's like, "Please pick me! I'm so excited for your book." And we were like, "Well, we can't, we we can't deny you because you're amazing, I, and we're so happy." I think you cannot ask for a better narrator than someone who literally sings to you in order to get your i think that is that is ridiculously wholesome i think we might give some people listening to this podcast diabetes so please do go on yeah so moving on to back to mystic here after i dropped off rising stars i put up a little poll saying hey everybody i have determined based on the past two months that twice per week is what I can manage to pump chapters out and be comfortable. That's 4,000 words per week. I do about 1,000 words plus editing with Mystic takes about an hour and a half. What? Oh, I sit down and write 500 words. On the- her phone. Oh, no, no. If I'm on a computer, I write 500 words in an hour of my book. If I'm on my phone swipe typing, I write just over a thousand words in that same hour. But Jolly can do 2000 words an hour and just pump it out and be gone. That's a teacher skill. Yeah. My skill is swipe typing on my phone in a slightly awkward position covered in pillows on my couch. And I thought I should be professional now that I need to pump out more chapters and people are reading my book. So I Mm -hmm. borrowed the hutch and tried to write and my my speed of of production slowed down cripplingly. So now it's back to the couch for me. That is perfectly reasonable. I screwed up my right hand because of like stress and there's some sort of like vertebrae bull stuff going on. So I started dictation and it takes weeks in order to get from one mode of writing to another. So definitely see that. However, reclining slightly on a bunch of pillows and gently swiping across an instrument is something you would be familiar with. Actually, yeah. Right? Like slightly awkward position, kind of like bent over a little bit like like this. I never thought of that before. Roughly a couple months into me writing (laughs) Beers and Beards, Mm -hmm. my wife turns to me and says, Husband, do you think I could write a web serial? Okay. And I said, sure. I mean, at this point, I have a good workflow for my own writing. I would 100% support you on that. What do you want to write? And she says, I want to write a magical girl story. This was my first one. I ended up settling on what is now, but I I went through a month each of Mm -hmm. trying two other stories before this one. Okay. Um, So a magical girl story and... So the first one was a 30-year-old Japanese housewife who you find out was a magical girl in her middle school. And she's like sending off her husband with his briefcase and her daughter with her toast that's buttered, hanging from her mouth, running off to school, desperately trying to hide the fact that her magical pixie wand is glowing, indicating that evil has returned. And then she transforms and she's like, how did I ever fight in heels? This is awful. (laughs) And she goes off to go and fight evil now as a part-time housewife and part-time magical girl. It was was Sailor Mom. (laughs) That was fun. Uh, And then I moved on to a Western dungeon Mm. delve where it was like the wild, wild west. Yeah. 
And adventurers, instead of like mining for gold, you would mine to find dungeons so that you could become wealthy beyond your like wildest dreams. And it was the untouched oh. new area. And everyone had magical wands if they were mages, but like they had triggers. They had trigger wands. So oh, you would, instead cool. of pulling out your gun to fire, you would pull out your wand to cast. And adventurers called each other partner all the time. And oh, that's that was great. Fun. Partner. Oh. Partner. Partner. It's partner. partner. With a D. partner. Oh, yeah, partner. You, you have to say partner. Jolly oh. is right. The world definitely needs more spell slinger fiction. So uh, roughly, I think she did the most for the Western. I think you got through about five chapters. I did. But then, unfortunately, I sat down and watched a funny TikTok video one day. Oh, no. That's it. It was. <laughs> I know. That's what I say. That's what I say all the time. It's the TikTok. It's ruining everything. Yeah. <laughs> Pure heroin. Don't do yeah. drugs, kids. And this TikTok person found mm-hmm. a Tumblr post from the 2000s. It, it was a TikTok about a Tumblr, about probably a Facebook. It was the hero arriving at the Dark Lord's place, and then they sat down uh-huh. for coffee instead. And I thought, that's the greatest premise for anything ever. And I sat down on my couch, and in five days, I had the first 20 chapters written. Tumblr is a magical place where book ideas are born. I think there's even a tag, please write a book about this. So just go on Tumblr and look for that tag and you will find ideas. Your stuff sounds insanely fun so far. So you were saying, sitting down with the Dark Lord for tea and biscuits. So please do go on. So um, I ended up writing a story called I Ran Away to Evil. And Mm -hmm. the prologue is short and sweet. It's ding, a notification on your phone that says season two of the video game Otome is out. And when we talk about Lit RPG, I have almost exclusively read Lit RPG and novel updates, romance, Otome, and villainess things for the last five years. So, like, write what you know. The premise is that someone from our world gets hit by a car. You quickly realize that that's not the main characters, that... This person from our world who knows how the video game goes has isekai into the story and is messing everything up. That's why instead of the hero arriving at the Dark Lord's palace and murdering him, she comes in for tea and they have a lovely talk. And then she ends up living her best life, baking for the Dark Horde. Oh, that's great. All the machinations of this hidden character and throughout the whole series... There is this hidden character doing things because now that she's in the video game, she doesn't want the bad guys to burn down that orphanage. So she's going to (laughs) announce to everyone secretly without revealing her identity Mm -hmm. using the crystal cast system with her weekly like pots casts, you know, oh, just so you know, please save this orphanage from getting burned down. And the readers can try and figure out or Mm -hmm. guess who the secret character is. That reminds me. So please be careful. There's this orphanage in Warsaw. Just saying. Right? Just, just, just saying. Just, next week, be careful about that. Um, and also, if you want to support our show, click down below. There's links. And you're also getting something for it. There's bonus material for every episode. So go and check it out. When I first was talking to her about it, she was really saying, this is just like a fantasy lit rpg version of the bridgertons and i totally knew what that was because she sat me down and forced me to watch the first two seasons with her the first of which (laughs) she proclaimed was the most amazing thing ever and the second of which she proclaimed was complete trash no they weren't she swears up and down that the b scene was completely wrong it was completely wrong. It did not hold true to the... I. If I was not reading romance... Sorry, if I was not reading Otome, Villainess, and Lit RPG, and uh, Legendary Moonlight Sculptor from day one, I was reading trashy romance novels, one of which was every single thing that it was ever Bridgerton. And Okay. And Bridgerton has B scene? Not in the movie. Okay. Uh, yes, just like the B movie. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, it, yeah. It, it's I, a bee, I, it falls in love with the female love interest, and they get oh. into crazy hijinks inside law, inside of courts and stuff. I think I saw that on Top 10 Anime Betrayals. Yeah, so she decided to write a lit RPG version of the Bridgertons, and the, she took it from there, and mm-hmm. 
she hit rising stars? And... His fault. It's his fault that I hit rising stars. And this is where the blaming starts. Oh, yes, it's definitely, it is, it's all my fault. It has nothing to do with her, the high quality of her writing or the... The pr premise of the story that's really lovely. No, or her very high rating, which completely overshadowed my own. Nope. I think, but nope. I think it's good that you accept responsibility for your mistakes. Yeah. There you go. That's why I love my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this has been the Good RPG Podcast, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> uh, Phoebe, if you ever listen to this in the future, I love you. You were planned. <laughs> Actually, now that you mentioned it with like Tumblr posts and everything, um, I want to put out a bounty. If anyone wants to write a web series or Royal Road entry, like a short story or anything, about the person who drives the Isekai truck, let me know. I, there's a manga about it, actually. Okay. It's already done. Thank you. It's so uh, good. We've read them all. <laughs> uh, actually, I, I have a bounty here as well. Ooh. It's bounty paper towel jolly. Yeah, like in Germany, we have these chocolate bars that are bounty. Uh, let's go on with the show because we are getting off on tangents, which has been happening a lot recently. Now that we know both of your books, I actually want to ask you individually, what's the best advice you've ever gotten as a writer? Um, my biggest advice is write what you love and what you want to read. I love reading my own work and in a genre, in, in writing, you eventually have to edit it. So finding something that you're passionate about, that you're knowledgeable about, that brings you joy, will carry you far past um, writing blocks and stumps and, and problems. And I, I highly recommend writing what you love and also save the cat. Oh, okay. Save the oh, cat. Okay. We, we might be on an opposite ends of this because save the cat is a thing, yes. But um, I think people often take it way too far. The story becomes formulaic. There's a reason why you can close your eyes in any movie that came out of Hollywood in the last 20 years and just close your eyes and you predict the plot because they're all written after Save the Cat. I think it's a seven-point plot structure. Oh, yes. So Save the Cat is the hero's journey, very formulaic. It's just 1% introduce the world. 5%, you should have your Disney I Want song. You should know as the reader what your character wants and what they need and their kind of end goal. And then by 10%, something completely different should have happened to your character life-changing. By 20%, you should have a person who's introduced to your character to give them guidance as they go off and do new things. Mm -hmm. uh, the 30 to 50% is where... It's the, the, the fun times. Maybe not fun for your character, but fun for the reader. It's the, the adventure. It's the part where it's like, we tied to a tree and we're going down the waterfall. Are there rocks at the bottom? Yep. Okay. Yep. I got you. And I like Save the Cat because I ended up writing up to 30%. And then mm. I started writing at 50% the next chapter. Mm. And I looked at my manuscript. I was like, what's happening? Why is... Why does this feel so wrong? And it was only because I had listened to Save the Cat Writes a Fantasy at Pro Writing Aid, the conference. They did a whole mm -hmm. talk on how to write fantasy using the model. And I realized I had skipped this entire integral part to the hero's journey. And as my book is about a hero literally going on a journey through the dark enchanted forest, it, it ah. should have at least followed some semblance of that journey, I think. We are not affiliated with Pro Writing Aid in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> are you affiliated with Dante Alighieri? No. No. Okay. Yeah. You would say that. Okay, cool. Uh, Jolly, how about you? Mystic already said that it's important to write a story that makes you laugh. So you would probably say it's important to write a story that makes you jolly. You are what you write. I have actually found that when you really immerse yourself in your characters and your writing it can absolutely have an impact on your own outlook on life um write enough depressing material and it can absolutely depress you uh, write enough happy material and i mean it's not going to cure depression but it you know can make you a little happier just writing happy 
Yeah. Just to get you into trouble with both your kid and your workplace, I'm going to ask you if writing about dwarves made you a raging alcoholic. I've drunk more beer in the past six months than probably the previous three years. Witness. Are, are you for real? Yeah, for real. Um, I went. Oh, okay. I went from you know the occasional dinner or out with friends to uh, actively sampling different alcohols mm -hmm. okay. um, for research. And I really for research, of course. For yes, research, I, yes. I really need to start claiming those on my taxes as a business <laughs> expense. Yeah. You, please, please. Yeah, I, I probably, I, I probably could argue it very successfully. Actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so too. For all of you listening in Germany right now, write a book about beer, and then claim all of your drinks on your taxes. Oh, actually, uh, that's what what we do. That that's our I think it's like 11th grade class project. So, fun fact: we have two types of value added tax here in Germany. One is for they call it luxury goods. And the other one is for necessary goods or basic goods. Um, and beer is a basic good. So we got less taxes on beer. You, you heard it here first from, from Maddox. In Germany, the beer is just basically good. Yes. Yeah. It is very, very basically good. So where's the excellent alcohol from? Ireland? The uh, no. No, no, no. We have microbreweries for that. Go away with that. Actually, <laughs> I'm straight edge. I don't even drink. So, I don't know. To answer your question, though, the best advice I was given was probably have a backlog. Definitely the advice I wish I'd known the most. But above that, if you're looking at sort of advice for a new writer, it would be write what you know. Because, yes, you can do your research and you can definitely learn enough to, to do a story, but... It will be hard to write a lit RPG if you've never really read lit RPG. It will be hard for you to write a romance if you've never really read a romance. Because it will be harder for you to hit the tropes and your readers will absolutely catch on. Especially with lit RPG taking off and AI now being a thing. Mm -hmm. You can definitely spot some of the AIs by the fact that, well, an AI has never read a lit RPG. It, it's not really hitting the right notes at the right spot yeah yeah and if you aren't aware of it there has been a bit of an uptick in people you know plugging their prompt into chat gpt and then just posting that and you cannot spot at first glance i don't really want to go into the whole debate but just to explain what jolly was talking about okay having talked about advice what is one thing that you learned while writing that you would love to go back and improve on in your older works have a backlog <laughs> yeah I, i heard have a backlog yeah i've just been writing for fun on train rides and i posted like one chapter every six months maybe eight so once a year that really came to bite me in the ass because you don't get that initial momentum so there you go one of the things that jolly and i talk about a lot is Author branding, I guess, would be the colloquial for it in the industry. If your cover doesn't represent what your first chapter is, then your readers will feel a dissonance. So Jolly ran into trouble because his first chapter, it, it, it is an isekai, spoiler. Mm -hmm. And so the first chapter is this lovely farewell as his main character passes away. Aww. When I was writing, one thing I really wanted to push was a character who actually felt like an adult who had mm -hmm. lived a life and had died and was in a new strange world. Because I find very often, in, in, especially in Isekai, that the main characters are very much, oh, cool, I'm in a new world now. I, well, this is cool, this is great. And they just immediately move on with their lives, mm -hmm. which I always find quite jarring. Or they don't seem to ever care about their previous lives or yeah. think back on them or reference them never again, which feels odd, especially from a first person perspective. Yeah, it is very hard to write. I'm going to say that because it is very hard to straddle that line between I still care about my old life and not being able to proactively do anything about it. It is basically writing depression. And I think they're going to use my shout out this week for this. It is not a small author. It is not someone who's 
not done anything like this before, but I definitely want to give it out to unorthodox farming. It starts with, oh, great, I have been reincarnated as a farmer because it basically does a similar thing to your beginning with the main character sitting there, have, like all his kids are coming in and he's like writing down his memoirs. And he gives some really cool hints. The name of the wind t- does too, which is a masterwork in foreshadowing and then not delivering. Pat, please go and write. Actually, that's unfair. Um, Pat, I know it's hard. You do you. I don't want to push you anymore. I know it's really stressful. So take your time. Take 10 years, 15. I don't care. Okay, cool. So I actually, I, I went back and wrote a prologue because my mm-hmm. my first chapter looking at my metrics, I highly recommend you get metrics. They will take over your life and destroy any mm-hmm. ability you have to be social while you check them every 30 seconds. But mm-hmm. My metrics are showing very, very high on my first chapter loss in terms of readers. Oh, yeah. What is high for you? My first chapter has 40,000 readers and my second chapter has 20,000 readers. Well, it's 50%. And it's because he didn't follow through with his promise. He promised a cozy dwarf tale. And the first chapter you originally clicked on was someone just dying. In a fashion akin to Up. By Pixar. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. Which was, which was what I was aiming for, but in retrospect. So for the novel that's going to hit Kindle Unlimited here, I did write a prologue. I posted that prologue up on Royal Road. And I actually crafted around, actually specifically unorthodox farming. Although mm-hmm. oh, I, cool. I found unorthodox farming gave away a little too much in the prologue. Yeah. So I went a little less far forward. He wrote his prologue from the end of the story. Whereas I tried to write mine from sort of midway through. I think that's a problem actually a lot of people have with prologues. I know in the author discords, a lot of authors do talk about how they even skip prologues when they're reading, which I do actually all the time come to think of it for that exact reason. The prologue is the best thing. It's the amuse goal. Yeah. I have several questions. You said you wrote your prologue from midway through. What are you going to do when you reach that point? Well, I'm past that point now. Oh, okay. The prologue is essentially right around the end of the first book. And then did you switch tenses? Nope. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, because we had that discussion about first person present. We've had some fun on the Crit RPG Discord writing second person future narration, which is uh, <laughs> which was fun for a while, but it's completely illegible. So, Jolly, thank you. Mystic, what about you? What's your best advice? I think it's the branding. It's Um, Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. We talked about it. Which sort of metal would you recommend for branding? Jolly would say gold is gold. Mm -hmm. But it it, it melts at a pretty low temperature here. Yes. But I would say, oh, I'm not... Mithril. You know, or or, or a calcum. Iron heats up nicely and holds its form. So it's very good for branding. Okay, Okay, cool. And you keep them in place, just, you know, gently holding them. Okay, good. I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Definitely, it can help. For those of you who have been reading very closely the titles that you see popping up on Rising Stars, 99% of the time nowadays, they have some kind of a branding in the title for what you can expect. So it'll say, for example, Mystics, I Ran Away to Evil, which is irate. Mm -hmm. For those of you who like acronyming, she was very, very proud of that. And all of her that future cool. books in the series are planned to be similar acronyms. But there is something to that. If you write, here's the title of the book, a cozy lit RPG rom-com, mm-hmm. people don't read the tags. They don't. It's good for searching, yeah. but they don't read the tags. So if you put the genre premise inside your title, it really helps with that branding. Mm-hmm. I I have a shout out for an old guy. His name on Royal Road is Dad's Bedtime Stories. And his story is called My Sons and I Got Easy Kite to the Losing Goblin Side. He's a really sweet dude. And he writes all these books that he would tell to his kids. Fascinating person. I hope I can get him on the show at some point. So I want to try out a new segment. And it's called One Book That You Love and Why Is It Awesome? Do you want a new book or just a book we love in general? Hmm. I think there's going to be time. There isn't, but I'm going to pretend there is. 
for new stuff in a few minutes. But I think I would love a book that you love. I would say for myself, if there was one book that I could just praise to a high heaven and call one of the seminal pieces of literature, it would be the Vorkosikan series by Lewis McMaster's mm -hmm. Bujold. Space opera. Mm -hmm, okay. Yeah. Not, not a fantasy, not a literary PG, not an isekai. It's a, an old-fashioned 90s space opera. The main story follows the plot of a young man, essentially just turning kind of 17, 18. The first couple of books are very much a coming-of-age story about a boy with a serious congenital disability who lives in a regimented perfectionist society, sort of military society, becoming by accident a mercenary space captain and mm -hmm. the rest of the story as one does as one as one does and the rest of the very actually extensive series follows him growing up they're not in the point a point b point c point d they're point a five years later point b they essentially follow all the major points in his life so the first one is him graduating academy and attempting to join the military and failing out because of his disability. He's three foot four, three foot four, mm -hmm. maybe. Mm -hmm. Yes. My one biggest wish right now is that Peter Dinklage could play him because it, just in terms of who he is and how he carries himself, he's exactly how I've always imagined the character. It's Tyrion Lannister in space. Yes, it's essentially Tyrion Lannister in space. Enough said, period. But it's not literary PG. It's okay, though. What makes it awesome? Everything from the, the characters, the characterization. If I could say a series that has had the most influence on my own writing would definitely be that series. There's a character in it called Ivan Borkosigan, who I very much see my entire book, his particular mm -hmm. brand of humor, a lot of the, the story beats and the... Writing style mirrors a lot of Bujold's writing. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not going to hold myself to the same standard, but I definitely oh. like it. And she does swap the styles. So the first book in the series, it's very much written in an old style romance to members of opposing planetary enemy governments falling in love. And that's the first book in the series. And the second book is a coming of age. And the third book is written as a military opera and the next one is written as a mystery and then there's a rom-com and then there's a standard action book and then another romance so she she writes them very much as completely different style books so a little bit like um altered carpet cool and you missed it so when i got mm -hmm. my library card the very first time that i was handed a library card i took out two books a Land of the First Adventure by Tamara Pierce and Dealing with Dragons by Patricia C. Reedy. And Dealing with Dragons is in the Enchanted Forest uh, Chronicles. This series that I am writing, I Ran Away to Evil, is an homage, I hope, mm. um, to my love for the no-nonsense fairy tale attitude of Dealing with Dragons about a princess who's like, I'm tired of just dancing in embroidery and listening to minstrels talk about how brave daddy is and how lovely his wife and daughters are so she runs away and volunteers to be a dragon's princess and ends up mm. baking cherry's jubilee and reorganizing the latin scrolls in the library and overthrowing an entire wizarding plot to murder all the dragons so you know as you do on a wednesday as you do on a wednesday yeah if you've read vinker the dragon it is very important that every dragon and has uh, at the point of this recording, we will probably have talked about it last week. It's, uh, my original shout out was going to be um, Dragon Sorcerer Claws Out, because I love dragons. And oh. Dragon Sorcerer Claws Out is from the perspective of a dragon in a lit RPG system where he what? is leveling up. And just the first few chapters, I'll spoil He's in his clutch, and humans trying to capture dragons have 
destroyed his clutch and he assumes killed all of his siblings so he's managed to escape and he's like i will seek vengeance upon these humans and as he's running away and surviving he levels up to adult dragonhood but in the forced Aww. magical lit rpg you have now joined the system oh, okay. the magic of the system hits him and a young woman is standing very close by and she gets hit with the dragon magic and so she becomes a dragon rider to his dragon, but he doesn't Aww, know that. Was so cute. And it's so adorable. And it's him being better at being human than everyone else. Cause to hide from the hunters, he ends up transforming into a human. And oh, he's like, okay. I'm way better at being human than these humans are because he's a dragon and he's got a dragon sized ego. And it's <laughs> the cutest, <laughs> best thing I've ever read. And I haven't finished it, but I love it. And I'm geeking out about it because that's my favorite right now yeah, it's a, it's a shame you can't shout it out yeah sad <laughs> <laughs> we didn't break any kdp rules there right uh exactly. that wasn't 10 minutes i'm still thinking like congratulations by devouring a princess you have unlocked the dragon system pretty cool well while we at it jolly you got any cool new books on royal road that no one's read before but you think people should read so when i totally didn't read the questions that we were sent ahead of time this is a completely mm -hmm. organic podcast. So you make that sound like it's a bad thing. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Uh, yeah. I thought about the stories that I've been reading, and I decided I really wanted to use this sort of shout out for my first shout out. When I first posted Beers and Beards to Facebook, I mentioned earlier in this podcast about the person who shouted me out and gave me a bunch of followers and then propelled me on to rising stars and then i just ramped up rising stars and mm -hmm. then got firmly stuck underneath blair which is complete unfair you know standard elf racism towards dwarves and <laughs> oh my lord uh pitchforks out and the person who did so was a writer by the name matador it was for mm -hmm. his book monster menu and for those of you who don't know, Matador actually passed away a couple months ago, rather suddenly. He reached out to me for a shout out for his new card based system. Mm -hmm. And I shouted that out and he said, thank you very much. And then we got the news about his death, I think two mm -hmm. weeks later or so. Uh, it was his psycho duel novel on Royal Roads. Mm -hmm. So he g gave me the shout out on Monster Menu. We kind of struck up a relationship and then he asked for a shout out on his Psycho Duel. And the reason I wanted to shout it out is that his wife reached out. She's been working with his publisher to get Monster Menu and Psycho Duel actually published and released. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to do a shout out for reading those when they hit Amazon. It's under Terrell Garrett. That's Monster that is, Menu and Psycho Duel. That is pretty cute. Thank you so much. Ooh. Cozy planet here. That's yeah. I mean, it's okay, right? You can't write cozy fiction without having a little bit of sadness in it. And it's, it sucks. People die. I think that would actually be something really good to talk about in this particular podcast is that definition of cozy. Because there is a pretty heavy, consistent fight going on right now, kind of in the cozy community of what constitutes cozy. Mystic is the queen of cozy on TikTok. No, no, I'm I'm lit RPG on TikTok. I have mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of watchers. But we do have cozy reads that are considered top cozy, where psychopathic murderers murdering kids, but they bake. So it is cozy. Huh. So, yeah. like, so the it, genre it, is so new. You don't know. Huh. It, it, is it cozy? Is it not cozy? They bake the children into the pie, so it is cozy? No, they don't. They just make giant gingerbread men that defend the city from the psychopathic murdering people who are cannibals. Um, I love so, Wizard's Guide to Baking, but it is, it's considered the top of cozy fantasy. Do you know Wittgenstein, the philosopher? Jolly's naughty. My family's German. Oh, okay. Well, that explains it. Well, Wittgenstein says that with any of these fuzzy categories, anything can be that as long as a sufficient number of people identify it as this. And even if they don't, if you identify it as cozy, it is cozy. 
And people are going to fight about it. But, yeah. Okay, so we talked about death, murderers, cozy planet, everyone. Obviously, you are more in the realm of not murdering people. Yeah. If there was one piece of advice I could definitely have for people interested in writing in cozy, it's that the most important thing to keep running in your back burner is that agency seems to be the most important thing for Mm -hmm. cozy. And even if everything is becoming depressing and terrible, as long as your character still holds their own agency, that's good. That was a problem I ran into when I was first writing. When I wrote Beers and Beards, I actually lost a significant number of followers, right? Around a little arc in the middle where my character lost agency in one chapter. And I think I could have gotten away with it if you didn't then lose agency again in a later chapter. I did a pretty heavy rewrite and then threw some chapters in planned to write, but was unable to write mm-hmm. backwards. I put those in between to kind of like break those up and reduce the impact or change the direction of the impact. But that was definitely where a lot of people said that was the least cozy part. And I was sitting there thinking, people dying and being murdered. Just for people who are maybe not aware of the term, when Jolly's talking about agency, he doesn't mean being a detective, but being in control of their own fate. I mean, actively doing something about it. I definitely had the same thing. So Samantha, for the first two chapters, she was just following this guy around. But he explained the world, and it was 5,000, 6,000 words of, oh, yeah, this is also going to happen. This is also going to happen. And she was nodding along. I took those two chapters, I chopped them apart, and now they're 75,000 words. Because as soon as characters get agency, they start to do stuff. So this is good. But also, I definitely see where you're coming from because it made for a terrible read. I think this is true for all books in general. If your character doesn't have some sort of drive, they are going to make for a boring read. But especially in a cozy fantasy where nothing earth-shattering is happening to drive the plot forward, your character has to want to do something. Yeah, motivation's a big driver. In the cozy genre, where it's one thing to say, I want to sit down and write a story about somebody who cooks, but it's another to turn that into an entertaining story. Yeah. For example, an Apple TV show, The Bear, it's about this Michelin star chef who takes over his rundown diner of his dead brother. And there's multiple levels of tensions going on. There's, does he even want to keep the diner? All the people working in there are assholes with their own problems and does he want to keep cooking even is he going to deal with his emotional struggles and also there's other characters who have their drives and it's a pretty good show it doesn't explain itself really well and it's kind of confusing at times it's very apple tv just going off on that tangent for a little for a little bit quit rpg podcast everyone where we talk about movies and apple tv all right mystic we didn't have yours did we oh on royal road um, we're not allowed to talk about merchant crab, right? Oh, God damn it. No, <laughs> no more merchant crab. Okay. Well, what about cash crustacean? No, no, not cash crustacean. Ah. I was doing a swap with someone last ray of hope. And in a lot of swaps, you read the first chapter to, to get a good idea. And then I sat down and I read like 10 20 chapters mm. instead you know you sit down like, oh i'm gonna check this out and then you you've gone so far um yeah. so I, I really enjoyed a last ray of hope which is portal fantasy and i also really enjoyed crypt bride uh and it's about a girl who ends up marrying a dungeon and becoming a dungeon and the oh. romance she has with the dungeon yeah we were talking earlier about expressive titles and it's very cool if you have a title that's my 1500 years old journey of becoming a wuxia master in the glorious mountains of the desert winds but that's very descriptive for royal road but people can't give you recommendations because they always forget what your book is called so uh, pick a really snatchy title and then add something at the end of that is my advice yeah a good subtitle i mean beers and beers is awesome i actually came up with the title first Essentially, I came up with the title and then thought, mm. how can I turn this into a story? Oh, yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. 
definitely can relate. I have some stories like that. And I have more questions to ask you after the podcast is already over. But at this point, we've been recording for one hour and six minutes. So it's a good thing we didn't do it at midnight. Yeah. It's a very good thing we didn't do it at midnight. Okay. Now we're getting to the end game. I still haven't watched that. Spoiler. Half the people die. It was end game, right? Was it end game or was it the other one? I don't know. They all blurred together in uh, the yeah. It's it, I mean they were they were really good, but yeah. Okay, so um, more shout outs and then we're done. Okay. So shouting out uh, could RPG Discord. Everyone there hosts old folks. Sean K novels. Oh, by the way, K novels is on popular this week, right under Room One Professor, and he has been holding there for a while, which is a mystery to everyone, especially him. But he enjoys it, and he's doing his thing, and we're really proud of him. Okay. How about you guys? I guess we can shout out our own Discord, Cozy Planet, uh, named after our planet motif. For Mm -hmm. those who know music, we're actually based off of the planet suite. Hmm. Is there a majestic Mars already? Uh, Not yet. I think Mars might... Spot's open. Is Mars the Warbringer? Mars is the Warbringer. Yeah. Oh, there was a Mars in the... Um... Yeah, somebody temporarily was Mars. Yeah, and mm-hmm. I think they have it out. Yeah. Hmm. Other than that, more shout-outs. The Friendly Neighborhood Wizard, if mm-hmm. you haven't seen it, is a super fun concept. I definitely really enjoy that style of story. Definite preferences. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, there's this book called Cradle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that oh, yeah. series, it starts with a book called Unsold. It's not very popular, but the... Author just came out with the last book in the series. His name is Will White. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, I think I think it kind of went under a little bit in the old hop hub. So um, yeah, I mean, if you want to support small indie authors, definitely Will Wright. What was it called again? Um, it's the Cradle series. Oh yeah, yeah Cradle. I, I I was thinking Hug for some reason. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah, so I've never heard about it before. So it's definitely a good good book that you should maybe read. I hear the second one is where everybody picks up. Um, okay, cool. I'm usually more brain than I am now. Um, it, it is very late for you guys because of the time difference. I think for you, it's like almost midnight. It's, it's 12.30. It's 12.30, okay. Then I shall release you into the warm embrace, or should I say Absolutely. the warm cradle of your yeah. bread. When I post chapter late tomorrow, I can blame Maddox. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I already right. am late. I was supposed to get my chapter to the patrons. Was... <laughs> yeah, I'm going to keep that in, actually. Oh, <laughs> hey, you know what? If I said it, I said it. <laughs> so this is how it goes. So for all of Neptune's patrons, she is going to be very sleep deprived when she releases her chapter today. So please be gentle. <laughs> This has been a blast. We're at one hour ten now. Um, We're probably going to cut this in two because it is very long and no one has a one hour ten commute. I'm also going to edit it down a little bit. So if you're listening to this, then chances are this is not the one hour ten mark, but maybe 50 minutes. We'll see. Thank you two for being here. Well, I mean, I didn't go anywhere. It's in my house. Uh, yeah, well, thank you for being in your house and reconnecting via the internet to this podcast. This has been tremendous, and this has been the Quit RPG podcast, where your podcaster has been standing on his two feet for over an hour. This is a very and I thank you very much. Yes, you. Are you saying it's a cozy chair? And with that, we will be going. Thank you so much. Bye bye. This episode has been brought to you by the Council of the Eternal Hiatus. If you're looking for a Discord server to discuss, read, or write lit RPG, this is the place for you. The server is hella queer, so everyone is welcome. You can find an invite link in the description below this episode.